Good morning, everyone. I'm not sure what's worse. I'm from the East Coast or I'm an attorney. Uh, I'm, I'm wearing a tie, which I know is, uh, might be forbidden uh, with this group. But you know, if I wasn't wearing a tie, maybe you wouldn't take me as seriously. Uh, so I'm going to be talking this morning about cannabis regulation. Uh, I know most people in this room want to talk about breakthroughs and talk about what the potentials of this uh, wonder plant are. And I'm not here to rain on that parade, but my job and what I do with my clients is I look at what are the regulations? How do you get licenses to grow, process, and dispense cannabis? How do you transport investigational drugs across state lines? Obviously, this is still federally illegal in the United States, and so talking about regulation is necessary, unfortunately, but uh, hopefully, you know, with my background and the things that I've looked at, uh, I can come up with creative solutions and, and interesting ways to look at these issues. So here we go. So you're, you all have copies uh, or will have a copy of my slide deck. Uh, I want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. I know it's very common at conferences for people to take pictures of slides. I have no problem if you do that. If you email me, I'm happy to email you a copy of my deck directly so you don't have to take pictures, but it's completely up to you. So look, uh, I think most people in this room understand what the regulatory status of cannabis is, but, but let's just briefly talk about it for those of you who are new to this space and to make sure we're all on the same page. So 31 states, depending on how you do the count, and the District of Columbia have some sort of a medical program, what I'll call a functioning medical marijuana program. Then nine of those states also have recreational programs. Again, people dispute these counts, but nine and 31 are, are generally agreed to. The District of Columbia has this interesting program called a gifting program. You can't actually go and buy recreational cannabis in DC, but if you buy a t-shirt for $50, you can be gifted cannabis. Uh, go, f go figure the prospects of that. Uh, there's absolutely no, no possibility for confusion. So states are establishing these programs every day. And before you think that it's just what you consider to be liberal states, you know, Oklahoma just passed a, a referendum. Uh, and has a lot of people who are interested in getting these licenses. Utah, it's on their ballot for this fall. This is not a red state, blue state issue. Uh, so those who think about this as a Republican, Democrat, old, young, male, female issue, do so at their own peril. The demographics cut across every different line. So don't just get lazy and think that you can assume that a state doesn't have a program because the, the fact is m the majority of states do have programs and probably after the upcoming election will, there will be more to that number. So when I first uh, wrote this slide, it says President Trump on marijuana. I wasn't trying to be cute. Uh, I'm talking about President Trump's positions uh, on, on cannabis. Uh, but if you think I was trying to be funny, then, then I guess I'll take credit for that. So we actually don't know very much about what the president's positions are on cannabis. He obviously said, or not so obviously, but as some of you might know, he said on the campaign trail, that's a state's rights issue. I'm not going to interfere. Uh, he did issue this signing statement with the omnibus, omnibus bill. So there's these omnibus bills because Congress, unlike when I worked on Capitol Hill years and years ago, getting standalone spending bills done are, are completely impossible now. So they do these mega omnibus sometimes called Christmas tree bills, and a bunch of things get stuffed under the tree. Um, so in any event, uh, he issued this signing statement that essentially said, I'm reserving my right to do what I want to enforce federal law. Thanks, very helpful to get, give us your, your uh, position on, on cannabis. So Tom Angel, who has this uh, daily newsletter that if you're not reading it, I think it's pretty worthwhile. I read it every morning among many other publications, said my read is that he's basically reserving the right to do whatever he wants, which is what I just said. Uh, by the way, I go overboard, overboard in putting links and sources in my presentations. This is for a few reasons. One, because I'm a nervous lawyer, it's you know, some CYA, but also, and more importantly, it's so you can all see what I'm reading. And the answer is I'm reading a lot of things, and to keep up with developments in this space, you need to read a lot of different sources. Also, a lot of people report things incorrectly, and so checking two or three or four different sources is probably a good idea. So again, President Trump said on the campaign trail, it's, I'm gonna leave it to the states, fine. Um, recently, after Jeff Sessions rescinded what's known as the Cole Memorandum, and we'll get back to what that is, Cory Gardner, Senator from Colorado, said, all right, you're, gonna, you're going to encroach on states' rights in the cannabis space, I'm going to put a hold on every Department of Justice nominee. It worked for a while, and then uh, Cory Gardner made, I think what Trump would say, uh, if he's talking about it, was a bad deal. Uh, Cory Gardner basically 
pulled his holds on these nominations for Trump's support of a bill that didn't yet exist on his desk. I thought it was, I thought Gort Gardner had a pretty good, a good point on holding the DOJ nominees. He was pretty bold on it, but he gave up a little too early in my opinion. So there are some pieces of legislation. There's this Warren Gardner piece of legislation, the States Act, um, which would make more permanent what Rohrabacher Blumenauer does, that amendment that I was talking to about these major spending bills that basically says, if you're in compliance with your state laws, the, the feds usually won't go after you, although there's a number of exceptions to that. In the interest of time, I'm shortchanging this. I assure you there are many more details, a lot of this, but I'm not gonna bore you with those right now. So I talked about the Cole Memorandum. Uh, this was a very, very important piece of guidance from the Obama administration that uh, essentially said, if you're in compliance with your state's programs, your state medical marijuana programs, the feds will not go after you. There are enforcement priorities. If you cross state lines, if you divert to youth, a number of different things, then we reserve the right to go after you because of course, this is all federally illegal still. Uh, I might be splitting hairs, but you'll, peop you'll hear people say, you know, California legalized recreational marijuana. No, California authorized people to grow, process, and dispense recreational marijuana in California. It's still federally illegal and the feds could technically still come in and say you can't do this. We all know that that's pretty unlikely as long as you're not violating one of these enforcement priorities. So this was a major shift in drug policy. It was very helpful. This helped the proliferation of the state cannabis industry. And then on January 4th, Jeff Sessions woke up and said, nah, I don't like that, so I'm gonna rescind it. In a very perverse way, I'm somewhat thankful that he did, and I'll tell you why. It has never motivated more action on Capitol Hill and made members of Congress put their money where their mouth is. The proliferation of cannabis-friendly legislation on Capitol Hill, although most of it ultimately unsuccessful or getting stuck in committee, has, uh, has flourished. And so Jeff Sessions, this is like a strict constructionist view of the world. He's essentially saying this isn't law. Congress, if you want this to be law, you need to make it law. So he rescinded the Cole memo. The impact on the industry has, has not been that quantifiable. I, I think the industry has continued to flourish. Maybe some CEOs of these cannabis companies are a little bit more worried at night, but generally speaking, enforcement has not been much greater. So again, you'll hear a lot in the headlines about, oh, the, the Cole memo was rescinded. So Jeff Sessions actually rescinded several policies on January 4th. It's important to know what all these policies are. It's also important to understand how these policies interplay with one another. For example, FinCEN, uh, which is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network of the Department of the Treasury, who has the Cannabis Banking Memorandum, that banking memorandum, which allows some banks or gives some banks some comfort to bank cannabis, that memo is based on the Cole memo. So a lot of people are afraid, well, now that the Cole memo has been rescinded, what's gonna to happen to the FinCEN memo? Secretary Mnuchin from the Treasury Department has said it's on Treasury's list of things to do. Uh, some have said that they're gonna rescind their memo altogether. Not clear, but again, it's important to understand the interplay between these things. And I know that regulations are not what a lot of you wanna think about or even think about uh, this early in the day, but you realize how important a, a role these regulations play and that's you know, what, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis as I look at these things and figure out how they actually impact the industry. So I'm not gonna get into that slide. Was his move, was Sessions' move to rescind the Cole memo surprising? It wasn't. Uh, if you read any of his quotes, he's obviously not a fan of cannabis. Again, you can read all these quotes. They're more entertaining than anything else. I don't think they're super helpful, but it goes to show you what DOJ's positions are on, on cannabis, or at least the head of the DOJ. So interestingly enough though, Jeff Sessions said there should be more competition for growers who are growing for research purposes. Okay, thanks, that's, uh, that's very helpful, appreciate that. So uh, again, if you look at Jeff Sessions, the lazy part of it is, the lazy approach is, he's anti-cannabis. Great, that's not helpful. You know, if you put policies in front of this administration that are tenable from their some of their strict constructionist small government view, I think some of these have a, a likelihood of passing and getting through, but again, it's Congress that needs to make the first move on a lot of these things. So, okay, what does it mean when Jeff Sessions rescinds the Cole Memo? Well, what it means is that U.S. attorneys around the country have a lot more discretion, and so you need to be paying attention to what U.S. attorneys in your gener your respective jurisdictions are saying. I have some reports here from Colorado and California and Massachusetts because obviously those are the you know, robust areas in this space. 
public opinion, uh, you know, my time is, is winding down, and I, again, want to leave time for questions, but again, if you assume that this is a uh, young, a, a pro-millennial uh, issue, or you assume this is a pro-Democrat issue, you're, you're wrong, and you're, you're making that mistake at your own peril. Uh, as, as a lot of entrepreneurial politicians have realized, marijuana sells the ballot box, and that's because public opinion is so high, no pun intended, on cannabis. So um, I would just mention to you that before you go out there and assume that you shouldn't be targeting to one demographic or shouldn't be including one demographic in a clinical study, uh, you, should, you should take a look at the numbers. I don't think anybody in this room is, is doing that, but I, I just go to say that the numbers are staggering. Public opinion support for some form of a medical program what I mean by that is access to medic, medic, medicinal marijuana for people that need it, not necessarily for the people who are answering the polling questions. Some of those polls are up as high as 90%. So again, the numbers are staggering. Talked about marijuana at the ballot box. I look forward to updating this slide in, in a few short weeks. I think it's going to win big again at the ballot box. Any of you who are in or have, are in or have been in the cannabis space, be that you know, a national operator, uh, be that a clinical researcher, you know what these issues are. But these are kind of the, hopefully I can go forward and back, yeah, these are the big six issues that I'll call attention to. And these are all because of the Schedule One status of cannabis. Um, I will get to, uh, and I'm not going to steal Alice Mead's thunder from GW, GW Pharmaceuticals, but we can no longer say uh, blanket statement that there are no drugs derived from cannabis that are uh, solely in Schedule One. I didn't say that so succinctly. In any event, cannabis is still Schedule One. There is one FDA-approved drug, Epidiolex, GW Pharmaceuticals drug, which was approved over the summer and just scheduled by DEA a few weeks ago as Schedule Five. But cannabis generally, and it's actually marijuana with an H, for reasons I can't explain to you, under the Controlled Substances Act, which is still Schedule One. So don't read any of these new headlines that say, after the great news, uh, at a GW Pharmaceuticals that their product got approved, first cannabis-derived drug that was approved by FDA. Cannabis is not descheduled. Epidiolex is not in Schedule 1. It's in Schedule 5. It's important to understand the differences here. Um, largely speaking, cannabis, Schedule 1. So what does that mean? It makes it hard to bank. makes it hard to get intellectual property protection. Mostly on the trademark side, there's a ton of cannabis uh, intellectual property and patents. Uh, the U.S. government holds a number of them, go figure. Uh, real estate, getting willing landlords, getting towns to not block your zoning, very difficult. Uh, as I'm sure mo those of you who have tried to get licensed in states know, you get a license, you work really hard, you spend a lot of money, your team pours over an application for months and months. If you get that long, some states like New Jersey give you 30 days. Um, and you, you go to site your property, and the local town says, nope, uh, we're going to make it very difficult for you to establish your business. You can't be within 1,000 yards of a daycare, 1,000 yards of a school, 1,500 yards of a house of worship. You realize that there aren't a lot of places to put your business that anyone would want to come visit you. So in, in any event, that makes it very difficult. Tax deductions. Uh, I'm sure the IRS is the bane of uh, many folks in this room existence. As some of you know, the effective tax rate for a lot of businesses in this space without effective planning can be in the 70s. Uh, you know, taking deductions for normal things in the cannabis business are a lot harder because, again, sound like a broken record, it's federally illegal. Uh, profits are derived from you know, an illegal source. So again, careful planning, getting a, a CPA firm that this is not their first foray into the cannabis space, getting tax attorneys and regulatory attorneys who understand this is important. Um, whether you hire us or not, I don't really care, but I would I advise you to hire someone who knows what they're doing. I'd love to talk to you if you're interested. Uh, drug testing and discrimination. This is very interesting. So you would think that if someone has a medical card, that if they test positive at work for, uh, you know, for marijuana screen, they couldn't get fired. Not the case. In a lot of states, you can still fire someone or refuse to hire them if they fail a drug test, even if they have a medical card. Now, I'm not talking about being under the influence and crashing a forklift into the side of a factory. You know, that's a for-cause type of uh, investigation. I'm not an employment attorney, but there's a difference between being under the influence at work, which I think any 
employer in their right mind would prohibit. But there's what I'm talking about is failing a drug test, not being under the influence. And there are just a couple of states, Massachusetts I know is one of them, Massachusetts, there was a court decision last year that essentially said you can't fire someone or refuse to hire someone simply based on a failed drug test if they have a medical card. So again, there are a lot of nuances, a lot of caveats, but you should know the laws in your states. So those who think it's easy to get a state license, I would uh, encourage you to look at this slide. This is just the, uh, the headings of the application in Pennsylvania to get licensed to uh, believe this is a grow, a, a grow process application. These applications are 1,000 pages. They are incredibly difficult. You get very little guidance. I don't know if those of you who are you know, used to dealing with departments of health where you call and you get put on hold and you, know, you eventually get to somebody. I'll give you an example from the state of Maryland where I, where I practice and do a lot of work. You cannot even call the State Medical Cannabis Commission and get a live person. You have to submit something in writing and you're lucky if you get something back in 30 to 60 days. That's gotten a little bit better now that the first licenses are out, but good luck getting a, a live answer when your applications are due, which, uh, which causes things like people having uh, the platforms to submit their applications crash and have no recourse, and then their applications are not accepted. So again, it's a problem to not be able to reach people. And this is, again, this just the headings of the application. They're very cumbersome. Talked about Rohrbacher Blumenauer. Um, my time is running short. Very, very quick and dirty. This is a provision in most major spending bills with one exception since 2013 or 2014 that basically says the Department of Justice can't use funds to go after people who are in compliance with state marijuana programs. So again, making sure that you're in compliance with your state programs, not transporting across state lines, not diverting to youth, not diverting to people who don't have a medical card or to selling to people under whatever the age of your state is if you have a rec program, again, you want to be your, the best friend of your state regulators because you don't want to give the feds a reason to come in and, and uh, tell you you're going to lose your license or, or go to jail for a violation of the Controlled Substances Act. So I talked about how se Sessions rescinded the Cole Memo and how we read Rohrbacher and Blumenauer together. Uh, so it's unclear how the, the laws are going to be enforced, but all to say everyone's looking at December 7th, which is when Rohrbacher Blumenauer expires again. One minute. Everyone is hoping that this becomes permanent. It hasn't become permanent yet. Again, Congress is very nervous to move a big, creaky, rusty ship away from the mentality of reefer madness and controlled substances act. I'm not gonna go through this. This is all the federal legislation that's pending. The, the only one that I would really pay attention to right now is this hemp legislation. A lot of people tell me hemp is completely legal. No problem. I said, well, you should probably tell Congress that because they've been spending a lot of time debating the fact that hemp should be legalized. So I'm not suggesting that the restrictions are the same as full-blown cannabis, but they are related. Uh, I'm sure a botanist could come up here and give you a much better explanation than that, but just know they're related and Congress looks at it that way. So again, you can read my slides. If you have questions, please let me know. State legislation, that's where a lot of this is happening. Um, I want to talk, to the, I'll talk about the FDA. I know Alice Mead is going to do that. All you need to know is that the FDA has said you can't put this in foods or dietary supplements. So before someone tells you that it's a full-blown pathway to do that, just know that the FDA has said you can't do that. Again, a lot of this is not enforced unless you're doing interstate commerce. So if you're doing within one state, generally okay. But technically, the FDA says that's an adulterated food product. So just know that. Read these slides. Um, you know, uh, Again, you're going to hear a lot more about the FDA approval process from Alice Mead. And uh, I, I will be around. I'm going to the airport shortly, so I'm not going to stick around too long. But my contact information is on my last slide. And uh, that's it. So thank you very much.